Okay, welcome everybody. As you can see on the screen behind me, tonight we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. I know all of you have your Bibles open and you are ready. Let's read our text and then let's dig into our text. Starting in verse 12, where the Apostle Paul said to the Christians there in the church in Corinth, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, Amen. Okay. Well, as you can see on the screen behind me, the title of our message is really the theme of not just the text we're studying tonight, but it's really the theme of what we're going to be studying over the next several months, chapters 12, 13, and 14, where we're talking about spiritual gifts. The big idea, there's one body, one but there are many members. We see diversity within the unity. We see within the unity, diversity. You starting to get the idea? If you're taking note, we're going to break down our text in the following way. Verse 12, Paul is going to give a clear explanation to the Christians in that church in Corinth. Just like the physical body is one, but has many members, so also the body of Christ, the church, has many members. He's going to give a clear explanation about that. And then verse 13, he's going to explain to them and to all Christians how we got into the body of Christ. He is going to 
talk about our spiritual position. He goes from clear explanation to our spiritual position. And we're going to see how we were baptized into the body and we were made to drink of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that regarding our spiritual position. And then verses 14 through 27, after giving the clear explanation, after talking about our spiritual position, Paul gives the body illustration. As I just read in the text, how the eye is just as important as the ear, how the hand is just as important as the foot, and how the eye cannot say to the ear, because I'm not an ear, I don't really matter. He's going to give the body illustration. And why is Paul emphasizing this? One body, many members. Here's the key point of our entire text. Verse 25, you can underline it. So that there be, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. There it is. If you remember, our friends that we <laughs> have met when we started this letter way back when, you know, the crazy Corinthian Christians. We've noticed a pattern in their lives in that church, right? That pattern, a lot of division. We saw in chapter 1, some were saying, hey, we're of Paul. Others were saying, no, 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 we're of Peter. Others were saying, no, we don't need human preachers. We're so holy. We're of Christ. They were creating division in the body. We also saw in chapter 6 that some believers were taking other believers in the church to court in front of non-believing judges and attorneys, creating division in the body of Christ. We saw chapters 8 through 10 that there were some mature believers who were looking down on the young, immature believers who had weak consciences regarding food that had been sacrificed to idols. And these mature believers weren't willing to give up their rights for the sake of the consciences of these young believers. And thus they were creating division in the body. We saw in chapter 11, the Lord's Supper, the chaos that was occurring there. During the love feast and the Lord's Supper, the rich who were supposed to help and care for the poor in that congregation. No, the rich were bringing their food and their wine, and they were eating their food and getting drunk on wine. The poor people would come. They had no food. And there was all kinds of division in that church, even during the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And then our section we're in that we started a few weeks ago, this section about spiritual gifts. Chapters 12, 13, and 14. There were Christians in that church who were exalting themselves and the particular spiritual gifts they had. They were setting themselves up as a kind of higher class of Christian compared to the other ones who didn't have the same gifts. And thus they were creating division in the body. And so in our text for today, Paul's big point in giving the clear explanation 
in describing their spiritual position and then giving the body illustration. Paul's main point was so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And boy, that's a great message for all of us, right? In the body of Christ that we've been placed into, the church, we've got to make sure that we do everything we can in the power of the Spirit and for the glory of Christ, that we do everything we can to make sure there's no division in the body, right? Well, if you recall, we started out in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, where Paul explained the importance of spiritual gifts to those Corinthians. We know that there were some there that were really confused about spiritual gifts. So Paul starts out our section, verses 1 through 7, explaining the importance of spiritual gifts. We also studied what spiritual gifts are, who has spiritual gifts, how we get them, and why we have spiritual gifts. It's not for our personal self-edification, but rather we all as believers have been given spiritual gifts, a variety of spiritual gifts. Why? For the common good, to bless the body of Christ, right? Last week, verses 8 through 11, we took a look at some varieties of gifts. We took a look at nine spiritual gifts, and we broke them down into the temporary miraculous gifts, which we teach have ceased, versus the permanent ministry gifts, which are still in operation. That list we looked at last week was not an exhaustive list. It was just simply a representative list, nine spiritual gifts. The point Paul was making to the Corinthians is, hey, there are varieties of spiritual gifts, but they are given by the one and same Spirit. And then today, our text, Paul emphasizes, just like the human body is one, the body of Christ, the church, is one. Just like the human body, the one, has many parts, many members, in like manner, Christ's body, one, has many members, many parts and varieties of gifts. And we have to fight to maintain the unity and to make sure that there may be no division in the body. Make sense? Well, let's start out point number one, Paul's clear explanation, verse 12, setting up this idea of unity, and diversity. The clear explanation talks about the human body. Verse 12, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, right? And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. Allie, do me a favor. I see one body. Uh, let me just see some examples of different members. Very good. Look at you. <laughs> You're taking a little bit too far with the hair. Yeah. Do, do you see the idea? The human body? One body, many members. Michelle, do all the members matter? Are all the members needed so that the body is healthy and can function properly? Yes! So Paul starts out here giving a clear explanation about the human body, 
It's one, but it has many members. And then Paul concludes verse 12 by saying, so also is Christ. Would you underline that please? So also is Christ. Now it's interesting. It's kind of surprising that Paul doesn't say, you know, after giving the clear explanation about the human body, it's interesting at the end of verse 12 that Paul doesn't say, so also is the church or the body of Christ, right? He says, so also is Christ. Now we know he's talking about the body of Christ, the church. Look at verse 27 when he says, you are Christ's body. He's talking to the church and individually members of it. But back to verse 12, I love this explanation. And you're going to see why in a moment. He says, for even as the human body is one, yet it has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. You see the idea of one and many? He says, so also is Christ. Do you see what Paul is saying here? That Christ is so intimately involved with his body, the church, that when you speak of Christ or of his church, you are speaking the same thing. Oh, I hate the church. Be careful. Then who are you saying you also hate? Christ. Oh, there's a bunch of losers in that my church. Uh-oh. Be careful. It might be true if you're talking about me, the pastor of the church, but about everybody else? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, Mario, one body you have there I'm looking at. You have many members. Do you wake up in the morning and say, okay, you, my right arm, you're a loser. You, my left foot, you're a loser. You, come on. Do you understand Paul says, just like the human body is one and has many members, he says, so also is Christ. He's talking about Christ's church. And he says, so also is Christ. That's how closely and intimately involved and associated Christ is with his church. In fact, quick example of that, go real quick to Acts chapter 9. The story of uh, the raging, crazy Saul who was persecuting Christ's church. And we see his conversion experience when Christ saved Saul. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murders and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You know the church of Christ. And Saul went to the high priest and he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. Why? So that if Paul found any belonging to the way, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through him. Saul wanted to go to Damascus. He needed permission from the high priest so he could find anybody up there who belonged to Christ's church. Both men and women. Saul would bring them bound to Jerusalem and try to force them to deny Christ and blaspheme him. Verse 3, as Saul was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who was Saul actually persecuting in that context? The church. Do you see what Jesus said? When you persecute his church, you're persecuting him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Do you see the association between Christ and his church? You persecute his church. You cause division in his church. You are persecuting Christ. Back to our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Do you see the clear explanation in verse 12? Again, he gives talks about the human body for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body though they are many are one so also is Christ his church verse 13 how is it that you become a member of Christ's body For by one spirit, notice one spirit, we were all, underline, baptized into the body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to, underline, drink of one spirit. How is it that you're in the body of Christ? Beginning of verse 13, by one spirit, we were all baptized or placed into the body of Christ. Christian, you were in the kingdom of darkness. But you have been redeemed and placed into, immersed into, identified with Christ, His body. You're in Christ. And not only that, end of verse 13, you were made to drink of one spirit. Not only were you placed or baptized into the body of Christ, also the Holy Spirit has been placed into you. Do you see it? Those two words, baptized into Christ and drinking of the Spirit, those are cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamons, <laughs> synonyms for conversion. You have been placed, baptized into the body of Christ, and the Holy Spirit has been placed into you. He indwells you so that your spiritual position is you are in Christ. You are a member of his body. Are you kind of like a halfway member? Are you kind of like, uh, well, let me just dip my toe into it? No. You've been baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit has been placed into you. Do you see your spiritual union with Christ and his spirit? Now, beginning of verse 13, most of your versions read, 
for by one spirit, we were all baptized, right? You see the word by? Underline that. There are different views based on the Greek as to actually who is the one who baptizes you into Christ. In the Greek, the preposition is the word en, E-N. En, depending on the context, can mean by, or it can mean with or in, depending on the context. Now, if you have a King James Bible, your version says for by, one spirit we've been baptized. If you have a new King James Bible, your version says for by one spirit you've been baptized. If you have an NASB, which I teach from, or an NIV, your version says you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, right? So, based on that translation, who's the baptizer? The Holy Spirit. You have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body. Let me see a show of hands. How many of your versions say by? Everyone's, right? Okay. Well, if you have an ESV, your version says with. You have been baptized with the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, which means that Jesus is the baptizer and that he uses the, that the Holy Spirit is the agent of baptizing you into the body. Okay? So there are two views. Some say beginning of verse 13, that it's the Holy Spirit who's the baptizer. You've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Others say that it's Christ who's the baptizer and he uses the Holy Spirit as the agent to baptize you into the body. And those who adhere to that saying Christ is the baptizer, you can think of member John the Baptist, uh, what he said before Christ came to be baptized and people were asking, are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? He says, no, no, no. He said, I just baptized with water and then talking about Jesus, what did John say about him? He will baptize you with the Spirit, salvation, and also fire, condemnation. Right? So those who say that Jesus is the baptizer and that the Holy Spirit is the agent, they'll refer to what John the Baptist said, the promising about Jesus would do the baptizing. Other scholars, again, your Bible versions all say that it's the Holy Spirit who's the baptizer, okay? How many of you would say that it's the Holy Spirit who's the baptizer? Let me see a show of hands. <laughs> you guys are funny you have your hands like this. <laughs> How many of you say that it's Christ the baptizer using the Holy Spirit as the agent? You're brave. All right. There you go. I would think it's Christ the baptizer and that the Holy Spirit is the agent, okay? So that's a little doctrine for you so that you understand. I don't wanna to spend too much time on that, but here's something I do wanna emphasize. Do you understand your spiritual position? You have been placed into the body of Christ and you have been made to drink of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been placed in you. Do you understand that? Can you lose your salvation? Unless you think you can pop yourself out of Christ and that you can make the Holy Spirit leave you. Next question. Who has been baptized into Christ and who has been made to drink of the Holy Spirit? 
all Christians or only a super spiritual group of Christians who receive what's called a second baptism. Why are you shaking your head, Bill? <laughs> no. Look at the verse. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we were, what's that next word? All baptized into the bot, one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Do you see it? Every Christian, listen to me, dear ones. Every Christian at conversion has been placed or baptized into the body of Christ and has the Holy Spirit has been placed into the believer. Every Christian. Notice again the words. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Can somebody be a Christian without having been baptized into the body or without the Holy Spirit being placed in them? No. In fact, just hop over real quick. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 9. However, talking to believers, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, finish the sentence. He does not belong to Christ. Right? Uh, hop over to John chapter 14. Jesus in the upper room with the eleven talking about the Holy Spirit who was to come. <clears throat> Starting in verse 15, Jesus said to the 11, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. Who's that helper? Verse 17, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. And here it is. But you know him because he abides with you. Finish the sentence and will be what, Len? In you. Go back to 1 Corinthians. There are those in the charismatic camp who teach that the fullness of the Spirit, the drinking of the Spirit, does not happen for every believer. They say that there is a second or subsequent, what they call baptism of the Holy Spirit, where this second baptism is when you receive the supernatural gifts like tongues and the ability to heal and so forth. And as a result, they divide the body. You've got the haves who not only were converted initially, but also they say received a second baptism of the Spirit where they've got all these great gifts now. 
So they are the haves, and then you have the have-nots. Didn't Paul say in verse 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized, placed into the one body. End of verse 13, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Len, did you only get part of the Holy Spirit? Are you waiting for a second or subsequent baptism of the Holy Spirit? Or have you received the fullness of the Holy Spirit where you were placed into the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit was placed into you? What is your spiritual position? Are you kind of like a mm, part way Christian waiting to be the full thing? Or are you truly saved? Are you truly in the body of Christ? Romans 8, 9 says, if you don't have the Spirit, you're, you don't belong to Christ. Right? Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He'll not only be with you, He'll be in you. He didn't say, well, He's only going to be part way in you. You've got to wait for another fullness. That's crazy, guys. Yet, and I'm going to get into this much more as we get into our, our chapters here over the next few months. This idea of a second baptism, a subsequent baptism. How many of you have heard of that before? Yeah? Absolutely. How does that make you feel because you don't speak in tongues and you can't perform miracles? How does it make you feel, Don? It makes you feel like a less than Christian. Maybe even causing you to question if you are a Christian. Because apparently you haven't experienced the Second baptism of the Spirit. Hello, there's no such thing. And I will prove that to you even as we go through Acts and we see Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19 where it seems like there's a second baptism of the Spirit. Uh-uh. I will explain that to you, but not tonight. You have to come back <laughs> for that one. Does that make sense? So let's just kind of tie it up here. Verse 12, Paul's clear explanation. He uses the human body. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Right? How is it that we are in the body of Christ. Look at our spiritual position. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized, placed into the body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit, the Holy Spirit's placed in us. Do you understand your spiritual position? And again, to say you can lose your salvation, I mean, come on, guys. Look at your spiritual identity. You're, you're, you're immersed in Christ. And the Spirit's immersed in you. And therefore, he's now going to give the body illustration. Verse 14. For the body is not one member but many. And think, Mario, if you wake up tomorrow morning and decide to create division in your body amongst the members, how's your body going to function? No good. Think about when Christians decide they want to create division in the body of Christ. How's the body function? What does Christ think about those who persecute his body? What does he say? Why are you persecuting me? Paul says, let's give a body illustration here to show how foolish it is what you Corinthians are doing in the body of Christ by causing division. He says, let's talk about the human body again. 
Verse 15, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. Paul says, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. Would you agree with that? Verse 16, let's talk about the ear. What if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, well, then I'm not part of the body. Paul says, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body, right? It's like maybe some of you guys saying, well, if I'm not a preacher, then I don't really matter. You're the eye that's saying, well, if I'm not an ear, I don't count. What? Or if I, if I don't have these gifts, then I don't really matter. What? Paul says, verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members in the physical body and in the spiritual body, the church. God has placed the members each one of them in the body, just as he desired. Tim, who gave you your nose? God did. Bill, who gave you your ears? God did. Isabella, who gave you your eyes? God did. Len, Yanni, who placed you in this spiritual body? God did. One body, physically, one body spiritually, the church. Physical body, many members. They all matter. Spiritual body, finish the sentence. Many members, they all matter. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, well, I have no need of you. I believe Paul's taking a shot at the Corinthians who were saying, if you can't speak in tongues like I can, you're less than Christian in this church. We really have no need of you. Verse 22, Paul says, no, on the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. I'm the guy you always see in the pulpit. And you all know when it comes to technology, I have no clue. But there's a guy behind the scenes, Dayon, who makes all this possible. Is he less than I am? Less important? Yet very often people say, oh, the pastor, pastor. The only time you ever hear something we mention about Dayon is when there's a problem with the technology, right? Well, let me tell you something. He's a member of Christ's body. He's been baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit's been placed in him just like with me. It's one body, different members. I have a role, Dayon has a role. Guess what? When we use our gifts, the body's blessed, right? But can you imagine Dayon saying again, verse 21, well, I'm an eye and you're the hand. I have no need of you. Or me saying that to Dayon. Or can you imagine the head saying to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members, you know, like Andrew, who's always up front preaching, guess what? He doesn't need any honor. He has no need of it. You thank Dayon for everything he's doing. You thank the wonderful servants in the church who show up early and stay late. 
so that we can worship our Lord on the Lord's day. And so everything functions well. Give them honor. Don't give me honor. But God has so composed the body, middle of verse 24, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no what in the body? Division. But that the members may have the same care for one another. I need your care just like you need my care. We need each other's care. And as each member, each body part in the body of Christ functions for the glory of Christ, we are all blessed. No division, guys. And I praise God, you guys are great. I mean, I could tell you stories about some pastors I'm dealing with it in their churches. Ah, uh -huh. I thank the Lord for you guys. Verse 26, I've seen this example in you guys time and time again. If one member suffer, all members suffer with it, right? If one member is honored, all the members rejoice. Now, Christian, verse 27, you are Christ's body. And individually, members of it. Do you see it? So what have we learned tonight? It's one body, physically. One body, spiritually, church. There are many members physically in a body, but there are many members in the church. And we know the Corinthians were creating division in that church. This was their pattern as we've been studying this letter. Now they were creating division when it came to spiritual gifts. Paul says, no, 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 no. He says, let me give you a clear explanation about the church. Just like the physical body has its one body, many members, so is Christ, he says, Christ church. So let me explain to you guys your spiritual position, how you got into the body of Christ. You were placed or baptized into the body and the Holy Spirit was placed into you. And all Christians, every one, had that same spiritual position. And then Paul says, you know, let me give you a body illustration now that's gonna make sense to you, Corinthians. Think of an eye and an ear. Are they in competition with each other? Are they trying to divide and break up the body? No. Think of the, the, hand and, the hands and feet. And Paul was using this illustration to rebuke the Corinthians so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Because you know something? When you are caring for the body of Christ, look back up in verse 12 at the end. Who are you caring for? So also Christ. Remember how we saw Christ is so intimately involved with his church? that how you treat the church is how you treat Christ. Go to Matthew 25. I'll bring this to a close. Matthew 25. This is what Jesus was saying. Starting in verse 31, talking about his return when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, that's the saved, the elect, and the goats on his left, the non-saved. Now watch this, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, to the sheep, those who were placed into Christ's body and the Holy Spirit had been placed into them, He'll say to the sheep, 
Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. When we have the same care for one another in the body of Christ, it's as though we are showing that care directly to Christ. But if we have discord and division in the body of Christ, then guess who we're also persecuting? Christ. Stay in Matthew, go to chapter 18. Again, to show you Christ's intimate relationship his intimacy with his body. Chapter 18, starting in verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yoy, these guys. So Jesus used an illustration. He called a child to himself and set the child before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Think of young children, completely dependent and trusting when it comes to their parents. Humble, looking to the parents for everything. Jesus said, that's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the narrow gate. You come completely dependent on the mercy and grace of God through Christ. Humble, broken, contrite. Jesus said, unless you're converted and become like children, he's not saying be childish, but be childlike, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child, i.e. believer, who through childlike faith came to Christ, Jesus says, whoever re receives such a child, a born-again believer, in my name receives me. So let me stop here and just ask a quick question. Are you 100% certain that you're in the kingdom of heaven? Notice Jesus doesn't say here that join a church or join a specific denomination and then you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. No. Jesus doesn't say do these certain works, go through these, this cer certain sacramental system and then you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. No. Jesus said you have to be humble and show childlike faith and dependence on Christ and Christ alone to save you. You've got nothing to offer for your salvation other than your sins. Have you come to Christ? And be honest with yourself. With childlike faith? 
beating your breast and crying out, please have mercy on me, the sinner? Jesus says that's how you enter the kingdom of heaven. It's the narrow gate. It's the broken, contrite spirit. It is the one who is spiritually bankrupt and completely dependent on the grace of God. Childlike faith. Have you done that? Have you admitted that you're a sinner who cannot save yourself? Have you praised Jesus that he's the only Savior and that he came to save wretched sinners like you and me? Have you cried out to him and said, Jesus, I believe that you are the promised Messiah. I believe that you lived a perfect life in my place and I believe that you are on that cross in my place for my sin. Have you said that to him? Have you declared Jesus, thank you that you willingly had my sins placed on you and God's wrath poured out on you instead of on me? I deserve that, Jesus. Jesus, I believe you died, but three days later you rose in victory. And Jesus, I believe you paid for my sins in full. And I believe you're the only way the truth and the life and there's no way I can enter the kingdom of heaven except through you. Jesus, please, I come to you with nothing to offer you. I'm a wretched sinner. Please be merciful to me. Have you done that? If you have, you've been placed into, baptized into the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit has been placed into you. You have drunken of the Holy Spirit. That's your spiritual position. You are safe and secure. You're a child of God forever. If you haven't come to Christ, guess what? You're outside. Your spiritual position is you're lost. And if you're to die in that state, then you're damned forever. So let me say it again. Make sure you don't close your eyes tonight before making sure that you have truly come to Christ with childlike faith for salvation. Make sense? And for those of us who know our spiritual position, again, verse 5 and verse 6. How have you, re- how have you treated those who have been saved by Christ? Have you received them? Have you honored them? Have you served them? Have you cared for them? Because Jesus says, whoever receives one such child, i.e. believer, in my name receives who? Me. over this past week when it comes to this particular body of Christ. How much care have you shown to Christ based upon your care for his body? Have you called and encouraged somebody? Have you prayed with and for them? Have you sent them an encouraging text message? This past Lord's Day service, did you hug them? Did you acknowledge them? Did you thank them for being in the body with you? Did you go get them a cup of coffee? Did you tell them how much they matter? and how important they are to you in this body? Or did you ignore them? Or maybe even 
did you in your actions and attitude cause them to stumble? Jesus says in verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble. How much does Christ care for his body? He says, it would be better for you, Andrew, that you wrap a heavy millstone around your neck and you go to Deerfield Beach and drown yourself in the ocean. Now Jesus is not endorsing suicide, but it would be better for me to go drown myself and immediately be brought home to heaven so that I could no longer cause division and stumbling in the body of Christ. Do you see why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, one physical body, many members? And he says, so also is Christ. Because when you talk about the body of Christ, you talk about Christ. And when you show care for one of his, you're showing care for him. And when you cause division with one of his, or cause them to stumble, finish the sentence. Jesus says, Andrew, go drown yourself in the ocean. Let me bring you home so you can cause no more division in my body. There's one body, many members. Why don't you spend some time now with the Lord? If you haven't yet truly come to Him with childlike faith, now's the time. And for the rest of us, maybe there you need to do some repenting over your care or lack thereof for members of this body. Maybe you need to ask the Lord to give you the strength and the grace so that you can start to show the care that you need to. Because in doing so, you're showing love and care 